Uh, hi, uh, my name's Jeremy. Uh, I work a medical device manufacturer called ResMed. Uh, we make a, a, a CPAP machine. It helps people breathe at night that suffer from um, sleep apnea. Uh, so we do a lot of uh, embedded C++ work. Uh, but that's not what I'm talking about today. That's just where I happen to work. Today I'm talking about a binary tree. Uh, and why, why does it seem like most C++ programmers are, are rolling their own or growing their own binary tree? Uh, this is the, the outline of the, the talk. So it happens to you know, come out as a binary tree. It's nice and cute. Um, it's, I've also structured it like this because it is going to seem like I jump around from topic to topic a bit, um, but hopefully I'll, uh, you'll, you'll stay, you'll understand where we are, you know, where we're up to. So, you know, some introduction. Um, I'll talk about data structures or just structures, uh, both, you know, linear and nonlinear. Um, then we'll sort of jump over to talk about more conceptual topics, um, but also concepts in the, the C++ sense. Um, how a binary tree can sort of be conceptualized as a, as a coordinate or as a, a graph. Um, and then we'll go into implementation and some benchmarks, and that'll be it. All right, so how, how did this talk start? Someone, um, a Boost Graph user, asked the question, can we have a binary tree in Boost Graph? Um, you know, for performance reasons. Um, it wasn't asked on the Boost Graph, on the Boost mailing list, it was just on the, in the GitHub somewhere. And both myself and I think someone else, uh, uh, an experienced sort of Boost programmer said, no, it's, you don't need it. It's not going to be faster. Um, and the prevailing view, I think, was that you can just model a binary tree with the existing data structures and as long as you, you know, use the right existing data structure, you know, it'll be fine. I eventually realized I was wrong. Um, I'm, I'm still sort of yet to convince everyone else, uh, but that's, that's sort of what this talk is about. Uh, I realized I was wrong, um, that the fundamental uh, sort of difference is that a a binary tree is a cardinal tree, and you can't model cardinal trees uh, with the boost graph data structures. You can only, you can only model ordinal trees. Uh, a cardinal tree has a, a fixed number of child nodes. Uh, an ordinal tree is just an, an arbitrary number. You know, you just start adding descendants to your vertex. You got your first, your second, your third. Um, an ordinal in an ordinal tree, you can't you know, just add your second descendant without adding your first. So there's sort of no way to distinguish between a, a left and a right node in an ordinal tree. You need the sort of the concepts or the, the interface of a, a cardinal tree. And so a binary tree is just a, a special case. It's a cardinal tree um, where k equals two, you know, the number of descendants. And I, I realise this because I feel like I'm continually rereading this book. Um, anyone else read this book? Yeah, a few hands. <laughs> yeah, a few hands, a few hands. I highly recommend it to everyone, everyone that did not put their hand up. Um, it's not a very long book, uh, but it'll take you an infinite amount of time to finish it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's de dense, very dense. Um, yeah, there's also a lot of stuff about binary trees um, in this book. That's another good one. Um, part of the, uh, the, the joke slide that I didn't include because I was worried about copyright with the, the picture that I thought was funny, but it's just sort of like, all well, this stuff is from the 1960s. It's, it's old stuff. Um, the algorithms have been around for a long time. Uh, yeah. All right, so, so my goal after, you know, after someone sort of said, I don't know if you've had this feeling, you have you know, an argument with someone on the internet and they say, that's not going to be faster. And you're like, I'll show you, okay. Um, so in Boost Graph, there are these two classes, adjacency list, uh, which is mutable, so you can sort of do anything you, everything you want. 
uh, in terms of mutability, but compressed sparse row graph uh, is usually considered the efficient one, but it's not mutable. So my goal, I just wanted to create a binary tree class that sort of satisfied you know, what I thought was all the, the things that someone would expect. That is, importantly, that it's mutable. Um, now, I thought trivially it should also be a, a forest. And, you know, if you read Knuth, it's, he treats a binary tree as, as a forest of binary trees, one and the same thing. So, and that sort of excluded some binary tree classes that I'd sort of seen in other libraries where the, the data structure was just one binary tree and you couldn't model a, a forest of, of trees. So I wanted it to be faster than adjacency list and at least competitive with, with compressed, compressed sparse row graph uh, and easily accessible to everyone. I sort of didn't want to make a, I didn't want to suffer from that. Oh, it's yet another library um, that no one will hear about or discover or want to install. So, you know, putting all these things together and since I was already sort of, you know, using and working in, in Boost Graph, it seemed logical to, to put it into Boost Graph. Um, and Hopefully the other benefit is that you'll just get all the existing graph theory algorithms for free. Um, whether they're actually useful on a binary tree, sort of, yeah, I'm yet to be sure. So, just a bit of fun. Try to, I, I prefer an interactive uh, presentation, so for people that came later, if you've got questions, feel free to just you know, yell them out or raise your hand, whatever you like. Is there a binary tree in the standard library? Uh, who are the no's? Who says no? One person says no. Uh, yes? Not everyone's put it. Who, who, who didn't really like that question? <laughs> Few people. Okay. How many binary trees are in the standard <laughs> library? All right. Any, any zeros? I know I'm kind of, you know, okay. No takers for zero at the moment. Or maybe. Uh, one? Mm, maybe, no takers for one, two? Okay, two, a few takers for two. I don't know, more than two? Not, no, okay. I'm, I'm not that, honestly not that familiar with after C++ 14, so maybe there's more in 17, 20, etc. Um, this is what I think. So I presume everyone thought set, map, you know, or most of you probably thought that. He's got a red-black tree. That's a kind of binary tree. What about the heap operations? Right? There's no binary tree structure, but it models a binary tree, right? So I, I, I'm satisfied. To me, that's a binary tree. Um, I know to the object-oriented purists, it must look like a crime scene. There's, there's, no, there's no binary tree class there anymore. It's like all the methods are just like, you know, being pulled out. Um, but these are very specific kinds of binary trees. Uh, they maintain, you know, a lot of invariance in order to provide the, the features that, that they give. And the kind of binary tree that I was really interested in is just a general, a general purpose, or like a, a data-less binary tree, one that doesn't have to sort of satisfy these invariants. And it's, it's exactly like what Knuth talks about in Volume one. Okay, that's the introduction. So let's talk about linear and nonlinear structures. And because I sort of want to make the point that the dataless structures, or just structures, uh, are interesting in their own right. So if you sort of imagine um, a container or a data structure, but of, of nothing, right? Is it useful? I can say, like, most of the time, no. Um, but in the case of a singly linked list, and yeah, they say that these numbers are just to indicate, let's say, like, the, the order that these were, were added to the list. What about reachability? All right? Can you reach node, you know, four from node two? Or, let's say, you know, the iterator that points at uh, you know, node four from node two? In a uh, doubly linked list or an array, this is, this is, the answer is always yes. Every, no, every iterator is reachable from every other iterator. But a singly linked list, 
Um, not every iterator is reachable from every other iterator. You know, it is a question. If you're for just a simply growing linked list where you're just appending to the tail, you know, you can mathematically simplify this question to just less than. You know, I added, you know, is node four reachable from node two? Well, four is greater than two, therefore it's reachable. So you can simplify it. You don't need to store the whole structure. Um, but if you're rearranging the list, you know, things are added in, in sort of different arbitrary order, you can no longer just simplify it down to less than. You're probably going to have to actually store the structure with no data just to be able to answer the question of reachability. Um, all right, you tell me. Um, so what functions are there on the metadata, i.e. anything that is not the, the type T of a you know, typical linear structure in the, the standard library? Just yell out whatever comes to mind. Size. Size. Begin and end. Begin and end, yeah. Any more? All the empty. Yep. Empty, 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 but what happens when we start thinking about nonlinear structures? All right. So here we've got two binary trees, both of them systematically constructed, uh, level order and pre-order. Um, well, so you know, what about reachability on these? As, you know, as far as I thought, you're never going to be able to simplify the question of reachability down to a, a simpler you know, mathematical equation. You're always going to have to store the structure just to answer reachability, even when they're systematically constructed, let alone, you know, sort of arbitrarily constructed. And then, you know, functions and algorithms on nonlinear structures, plenty more. Well, I've just listed a few here. So weight is size of vertices, uh, the height of a tree, whether something is reachable, whether two trees are isomorphic. And isomorphic is essentially like the linear equivalent of isomorphic is, is just, is your size the same as mine? You know, is your structure the same? Uh, the list on the right is, is not so relevant to binary trees, um, but they are algorithms on graphs that don't take any notice of the actual data of a graph. They're just interested in structure. So just as a reinforce the point that structure is interesting in its own right. Take a sip. Okay. Talk about some more sort of conceptual. So, any, any questions so far? Actually, I guess yeah, Arthur. In your list example, the forward list example, uh, you called that nonlinear because the insertion order was. was structure of that list is still linear. Oh, if, if I called it nonlinear, I misspoke. Sorry, you, you, asked, you said I referred to the linked list as nonlinear. If I did, I misspoke. It's definitely still linear. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, the one with the indices out of order on this slide and the one with the indices in order on the previous slide, yep. is, are you considering those same or different? I guess it's not. Oh, same structure. They're, they're, both, they're both linear structures. Yeah. It's just nonlinear. That's why I was confused. <laughs> that's, that's a typo. Yeah, that's uh, just me not noticing that I yeah, didn't change the header. All right. Um, some concepts, conceptual. Um. All right. So this, this slide should be is just sort of here for completeness. Um, so I just want to talk about like how Boost Graph models its graph data structures and algorithms. And so to do that, I'm just going to compare it to how the STL models containers and, and algorithms. Um, so you're going to have to read all this. It's I, stuff I assume you sort of most, most of you know. 
algorithm data structure interoperability, just the fact that you know, we have containers that are orthogonal to algorithms and we have iterators as the, the indirection, layer of indirection between them. Uh, you know, we extend algorithms through function objects as in accumulate, you've got the, um, the plus function object that you can replace with multiply or you know, whatever you'd like to come up with you know, different algorithms. And you know, we parameterize standard containers on type T. All right, comparing this to, to Boost Graph, Boost Graph sort of tries to a, achieve some of the, the same things. The biggest difference is the algorithm data structure interoperability. There's no kind of intermediate glue layer between the data structures or structures and the algorithms in Boost Graph. There's no graph equivalent of an, of an iterator. A lot of the structures, um, the, the graph interfaces provide iterators to do linear traversal over the, a nonlinear data structure. So you know, it, it linearizes it in different ways. But there's no, yeah, no graph equivalent of the iterator to you know, abstract structures from algorithms, which I imagine in, if we sort of ever move towards having a, a graph library in the, in the standard library, we would want something like that. Um, and so instead of extension through function objects, we've got extension through visitors, which only applies to the search algorithms, like depth first search and breadth first search, as, you, as they traverse um, graph structures, your visitor, um, is, it's a callback. So you can do whatever you like you know, as you traverse the structure. And the property parameterization is a bit more complicated with a graph because you don't just have one type of element and you've got vertices and edges and you might want to um, have different kinds of properties on a vertex versus an edge. Um, so in elements of programming, it's a, a bit different. You know, there's a couple, as I mentioned earlier, there's a couple of chapters on, on a binary tree in there. They just define a coordinate, which sort of, which I'll talk about later. But it's, it's, it's not really, sorry, an equivalent of an iterator. It's sort of like that. Um, so just to be explicitly clear about this, you know, multi-parameterization of a graph. So the, the, the numbers in the, the vertices are just to, to index them. Um, you might want to have strings on your vertices and floating point numbers on your edges. And you might only want values on your leaf vertices and only edge values on the first two um, layers. So it's, it's, there's just a lot more flexibility in, in, in Boost Graph for um, type parameterization. All right, that's just very succinctly what I just said. Um, yeah, any, any questions on this so far? Cool, keep going. Um, at this rate, I'm going to burn through this talk really quickly. <laughs> um, so maybe we can just like take our time on the code or, or something, um, or have an early lunch. <coughs> so yeah, elements of programming is really where I got the idea um, that you know we could have a much more efficient binary tree than than just reusing the classes in in Bruce Graph. And it defines, so it defines this bifurcate coordinate, just meaning bifurcate splits in two. Uh, and it, it, it fits with the sort of definition in Knuth. And I don't know if you've sort of watched talks by, by Alex, he'll often say that anything that he's saying, it's, it's, it's all in Knuth and everything in Knuth is all in, in something else in the past. Um, so, and so this coordinate is just a, yeah, it's just a recursive definition of a binary tree. There's no uh, encapsulating data st structure that goes with it. But for Boost Graph, we need this, you know, just to fit the, the interface and the concept, some sort of encapsulating class in which, you know, we store the coordinates. And 
So sort of the boost graph equivalent of this is to that a, you know, if a coordinate uniquely identifies a, a vertex um, in boost graph, that's saying, well, here's my vertex index in this graph. And then we're going to place, and then we know there's going to be a, a binary tree data, you know, structure in which that all that all lives. Yeah, Arthur. So earlier when you were talking about the difference between cardinal tree and original tree, yeah. um, I come away with a misconception which the internet will come corrected for me. But you're still talking about left and right successors here. Yes. Um, you're not talking about like a binary tree that just has like two children because it loves you boy. You still have a designated left and right. Yeah. To try and repeat you succinctly, um, you're um, just mentioning that sort of difference between cardinality and ordinality that left and right are, are not just the first and second, or? Well, they are the first and second. They're not just, I have two successors. It, it is an ordered pair of successors, left and right, not an ordered. Yeah, so the left and right is, is an ordered pair, yes, i.e. When you, when you add the first successor to an ordinal tree, you, you, you can't define it. You, is it left or is it right? Uh, there's no definition. That's about ordinal tree. Uh, okay. So an ordinal tree would actually be a little bit more like what I've been thinking. No, no, it's an ordinal tree which also still have a first and a second, but you can't add the second before the first. What you are thinking right. is that that is a set of two things and you can't distinguish what is a First, what is the second? There, there are just two things in there. You can get both, but I can't give you them in any order you want. Yes, that was what I was originally thinking this was going to be, and it, it is not. Um, is there anything interesting to say about that? What is there? I'm not sure. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, summarize what he said for those following along at home. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> we're just, yeah, we're just having a bit more of a discussion about exactly how to sort of define cardinal and or how to understand the difference between a cardinal tree and an ordinal tree. <laughs> but the, the cardinal tree has a fixed number of successes and you can distinguish between them. And you can have a right without a left. You can have a right without a left, yes. You can, you can add your right successor before your left or you can add your left before your right. Um, whereas with an ordinal tree, you just you add a successor, and that's your first one, and there's no sort of distinction whether it was the, the left or the right successor. You could probably do add a whole lot of more logic to sort of say, oh, I have null values, etc. But fundamentally, yeah, in the ordinal tree, you can't distinguish between left and right. Yeah. Is that uh, does that wrap it up? Yeah. For now? It's it's a trick. We've got time. <laughs> yeah, I can probably like slow down a little. Um, so yeah, we need to place this recursive structure just in some sort of encapsulating class. All right. I'm going to talk about the, the boost graph concepts. And so to talk about them, I'll just talk about the STL sort of container concepts that I assume you're pretty familiar with. This uh, obviously is just like a small subset of the container concepts from the STL. Uh, brown, red, depending on how, you know, uh, arrows means, you know, it models, and the black arrows. What's that unusual word in concepts meaning one concept? Ad subsumes. subsumes, thank you. Um, you know, sequence container, et cetera, subsume uh, container. So in boost graph, we've got the graph concepts. Incidence graph, uh, excuse me, is, is modeling that one vertex is um, aware simply aware of, of all of its outgoing edges. Um, that, that's, that's it. Adjacency graph is like the flip side to in incidence graph. If, you, if you're able to model one, then you're able to model the other. 
adjacency graph uh, is an interface so that you can iterate over all the vertices that are adjacent to you, i.e. at the, the other end of your outgoing edge. Uh, vertex list graph is really just saying I can iterate over all the vertices in my graph, which for a lot of graph classes is sort of trivial because they're just stored in a, a vector or a list. Uh, edge list graph, kind of the same deal. It's an interface, say, so I can just iterate over all the edges in this graph. Uh, adjacency matrix, I won't talk about really. It's uh, a special case that I don't use. And, um, but I've highlighted mut mutable graph, oh, sorry, and bidirectional graph. Uh, so if incidence graph is saying I'm, you know, I can model the outgoing edges from me, bidirectional is saying I can also model the incoming edges to me. Uh, and they're, they're sort of they're separate concepts, um, and thus interfaces. You know, it usually takes a bit more storage to model <coughs> some versus others. Uh, so mutable graph I use different, yeah, to the STL concepts because obviously all our all well, the containers that I mentioned in the STL they're all mutable by default. You don't expect to come across an immutable data structure. Maybe in the future with more functional programming, you know, stuff coming into the language. One question? Yeah. Why is, is there only an arrow from bidirectional graph to incidence graph, but not none from bidirectional graph to adjacency graph? Yeah, so the question was why is it only an arrow from bidirectional graph to incidence graph and not also to adjacency graph? So yeah, bidirectional is, I guess, does more complement the, the incidence. So incidence is modeling outgoing edges and bidirectional has the ability to model incoming edges, whereas adjacency models the, the vertices that are adjacent to a given vertex. So, so that, that's the difference that one is talking about vertices, the other is about edges. Yeah, that's right. One is about vert edges, and the other one is about vertices. Um, and yeah, vertex and edge list graph I, is just, I think, in the library for convenience. Um, so let's just sim simplify this a bit. We'll just drop adjacency graph because it's just, it goes together with incidents. Uh, we'll drop the union of vertex and edge list, um, we'll drop the graph suffix. Um, you still get a fairly hairy you know, diagram once you add in some data structures to say which, which structures model which interfaces, partly because most of the, the data structures model all the interfaces, just with the exception of uh, mutability. So we'll simplify that again. Uh, we'll just drop adjacency basic matrix because we're not, we're not going to model it and we'll uh, just shorten the, the name of compressed sparse row graph. I have a small question. Yeah. Uh, why is it mutable outside the category? Is that because by mutating the graph, you can convert between the different, all the different categories or some other reason? So your question is, why, why is mutable a separate concept? And can you change from, from No, no, so it's not, you're, not, you're not able to change from one category of um, graph to another. Um, it's separate because in, in the library it is modeled separately. Um, and yeah, because the compressed sparse row graph is not mutable. So there needs to be a separate mutable concept that the, the structures that are mutable um, uh, provide. Uh -huh. But if you have something that is mutable, um, yeah. you get it by const or something like that, then can you categorize it in the other? Uh, it's like, it looks like mutable is an extension of another concept, you know, a different thing. Hmm. I mean, if, if, a, sorry, if, a, if you get a data structure that's const 
I guess it's sort of the same, the same principle as if you get a standard container that's const. It still has all the mutable interfaces, you just can't call them. Um, yeah, not sure about Um, it's separate. So, like, why is it not separate in the standard library? Maybe. Yeah, that's fine. And I think that's because in the standard library, all containers are, are, are mutable, so you wouldn't need to separate it out. But in Bruce Graph, yeah, some structures are just not ever mutable. Yeah, not sure if I'm quite understanding your question or not, not quite answering it. Like when I said, you can have it regardless of. Mm -hmm. You take it, and then you can get another direction of that. And I would have invented the concept of that, which is a big change. No, it's a mutability. No, it's not direction about all by itself. All right, so maybe, maybe let me sort of explain. So mute, the mutable concept is really just the functions like add vertex, yes. add edge, remove edge, remove vertex. So it doesn't change the type or concepts that that graph um, implements. Yeah, Alpha? I guess one thing that might be confusing about this graph is that on the very left hand side, CSRG and JCC lists are types, and a variable can never have multiple types, but a type can model multiple concepts. So I can have a mutable vertex list or a mutable bidirectional, or even something that's both a vertex list and an edge list because it's in the JCC list. Does that help? Yeah, so in some sense, it's just multiplying all what you have there by mutable something. Yeah, it's like we're talking about two representations that you might have, and you still might have all of the representations. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Sorry, let, let me just repeat uh, what you just explained. Um, oh, if I can summarize it succinctly. <laughs> uh, mutability is orthogonal to representation and the sort of yeah, graph interfaces that it provides. Yeah, that was my question. Cool. All right. You both answered. Cool. Okay. Um, Arthur, you had a question as well? Yeah, where are the dotted lines? All right, thank you. Um, so not so uh, a graph graph edges can be directed or not directed. So you'll um, uh, a type will only model the bidirectional concepts if it actually has um, bidirectional edges. It's like based on template parameter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so that, that's something you choose when you instantiate um, one of these classes. I said at the start I was going to talk quickly, and I really have. Um, there's still 55 minutes to go. All right, so we're just going to jump right into the, the interface, uh, the implementation. I, I sort of thought maybe this, you know, the, the, the bidirectional binary tree seems to naturally provide everything that a forward binary tree provides. And <clears throat> so I maybe didn't sort of talk enough about this sort of concept of, of bidirectionality in a binary tree earlier. But it's, it's just the idea that you can find, you can find your parent, you know, that you store, to put it, you know, simply you store a pointer to your parent vertex. And in doing that, that gives you the, the bidirectionality. Um, you would still think about the tree as in the same conceptual way. Um, but in terms of you know, features and interface, yeah, a bidirectional binary tree does everything that a forward binary tree does. And so at first I tried to just, not that I'm a huge fan of um, public uh, subtype sort of polymorphism, I thought maybe a binary tree can just simply inherit from a forward binary tree and everything will fall into place. It didn't work. Um, maybe there's a way to do it but the problem I had was just with the, the storage of the, the nodes. So this is the current implementation. Um, just, you know, fairly simple. Um, well, I say simple by comparison to other code that I've seen so far in the, in the conference. Um, 
yeah, after seeing Hannah's talk uh, and David's, I feel like I should have, you know, ticked the, the novice or the easy, you know, mm -hmm. op option for this talk. Um, so, yeah, we've got class template specialization. Um, I'll, I'll show the, the nodes next. And so the, the node you can think of as essentially equivalent to the coordinate that I was talking about um, in elements of programming. And there's a, so what I ended up with is this, is this binary tree base class, which has most of the, the functionality of the forward binary tree. And then the, the specialization for forward where, you know, having a predecessor is false just sort of provides the, the wrappers of the interface and just calls all the functionality in the base class. And then the, the bidirectional specialization, again, uses all the functionality in the base class and adds in the extra logic to, um, to satisfy bidirectionality. It's sort of mostly boilerplate here. Um, these are the, the, the nodes, I where, how, the binary tree structure is actually stored. It's, it's pretty simple. Again, it's mostly a lot of boilerplate code. It's just an, an array of two successes. And it's, it's an array as opposed to a pair, because originally I was trying to model uh, a k airy tree, so a cardinal tree of, of any number of, any fixed number of successes. But k airy tree is a really awkward word to say, so I just dropped that. It's a binary tree. Um, and yeah, so here it is a simple inheritance, a bidirectional node just is a forward node and we just store one more vertex descriptor to the, the predecessor. Um, yeah, if you have any questions about the code, just yell out. Um, so this is the, the base class where most of the, um, the functionality is stored. So my, the main question I sort of had was like, okay, is, how am I gonna handle mutability? I wanna be able to add and remove nodes efficiently. Uh, so, I, and so, you know, removing a node, if you're sort of keeping a, a compact, you know, list of nodes and you remove one from the middle, you're gonna have that, I guess, performance issue of always, you know, moving the data, the data around the, that list of, of nodes. If, if you store it as a linked list, well, you've got other problems. Um, also, um, yeah, if I was just storing it as a compact um, array, when you remove a node, you're gonna have to, and if you then shift all the subsequent nodes back down, you're gonna have to go back through the tree and, and renumber all the, the indexes that are referring to those nodes that you've now, you know, repositioned. It's like, a, um, like invalidating iterators. So what I went with is a, like a sparse array structure. All the, the nodes are stored, but then when I remove them, I add them to a free list. I sort of more recently just thought, ah, this is probably not the best way to do it, to do a sparse data structure. Um, I think part of the reason I, did this, most of Boost Graph is in C++ 03. And so I was just sort of thinking in a very um, 03 mindset, but also sort of wanting it to be okay for you know, the standard library. Um, ah, you know, sometimes you, you make decisions and you go with it and then you look back and you're like, yeah, probably do it differently next time. Um, so maybe a better sparse array would just be to use um, an optional you know, class here because one of the problems with the free list is when you want to find a lot of the algorithms need to know, they just want to get a vertex that exists. Um, so if your list of nodes is sparse, but they're not, they don't have any sort of special um, flag to say that they're, they're, they've been removed, you've got to search through the free list, find a number that is not on the free list which means you sort of have to exhaust the free list. 
So at the moment, I store the free list in descending order. That's an invariant on it, which makes it easy to just get the lowest vertex that is, is still uh, present. But then there's the management of maintaining, maintaining that invariant that it's, it's ordered, you know, which costs something with adding and removing. So, yeah. Doing this again, I'd probably try something else. Um, go to the just boilerplate type aliases for boost graph. Um, null vertex is then used as like in the elements of programming in concept, there's the idea of an empty node. And so I, I use this to a null vertex just to define empty node. <coughs> I've mentioned the constructor, even though this is really trivial. Um, and it's not part of the standard, any of the standard, um, sorry, any of the boost graph interfaces. At first I thought I was kind of cheating. It's like, oh, I can, I can construct a binary tree more quickly by just telling it at construction time how many, how many, how many vertices I want. Adjacency list also does have a constructor that you can just pass in the number of vertices. And then when I tested it, it was slower than iteratively adding all the vertices um, after construction. I think the reason for that is that adding vertices in the, the general boost graph interface does a lot of checking to, to check that the vertex or the edge that you're adding is valid because you you might be allowing multiple edges between vertices and so it checks. And so in the adjacency list, you're actually just paying the cost of allocating all the vertices and then adding them with all the checks. And so it's quicker to just add and check at the same time. Um, but for the binary tree, it works really well. Uh, so could you go back to the slide? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, so n is, I guess, the, the next vertex that is not currently on in the list of nodes. So when you, when you add a new vertex, it's just going to grab that number as the, the next vertex to add and increment it. And so it just, it just maintains the invariant that that the free list is not empty um, and that it's in descending order. Well, so it mostly maintains the invariant that it's not empty. Um, maybe it seems a bit counterintuitive because nothing's been deleted. So it's really just saying this is the next lowest or highest vertex. Um, yeah. So I didn't repeat your question, but I hope I inferred it by my answer. Mm -hmm. Vertex there is a. Oh, sorry. I thought I thought it was a uh, value parameter, but uh, I'm wrong. Mm, that's right. But actually, you reminded me of something. Um, the the type that you use for the vertex here um, makes a big difference to performance. Um, so the default is 64 bit, um, but remember that's you're storing three, you know, two or three vertices per node. So unless you really need to model, what is it? Four gazillion um, vertices in a tree. You know, you want to actually think, think carefully about, yeah, how, what, what is the maximum size of tree I'm going to construct and, and choose a, a vertex size that you need rather than one that satisfies every possible um, size of tree. Is it the saying that the null uh, vertex is negative one string? Tree? Sorry. Um, is uh, so your question is that is is saying that the null vertex negative one strange? Intent it is intentional. Uh, I thought about it. Pretty sure it works for signed or unsigned vertices. Um, so 
sites are outside value. Mm-hmm. You can use standard numerical and it's uh, standard size to max. Mm-hmm. And that'll avoid compile warning. It's, it's the same thing. Yeah, so the button? comment was like. Yeah, it does if you turn all the warnings on. Okay. If you turn off all warnings in your code, then that's a warning. Huh. Because I usually. Slow down, slow down. If you're going to repeat these, I need to do them one at a time. Uh, uh, comment was uh, maybe it's better to use uh, max, you know, numeric limit, limits of vertex max instead of negative one, um, just be more uh, true to the type system. Um, I, I do compile with all warnings on, and I don't recall any warning here, but different compilers, etc. Yeah, it could be. Next comment that I didn't get to. I think Arthur, you had a comment just then? Comment was that the explicit cast is probably is hiding that warning, or thus there is no warning. <coughs> yeah. If you don't need to store anything in the vertices or else you can run it, you put void there, or be so complicated to the implementation that you just recommend putting on size and forget mm. it. So the question was if you don't need to store any data, would you put void as the, the vertex type? So this, so this vertex type is not like the type T of a vertex. It's, it's really the, the integral um, vertex uh, index type for vertices. So it becomes the, the vertex descriptor, which in Bruce Graph is essentially just an, an index. Yeah, so it's really not, so it's not about, uh, I wanna store this, this type on my vertices, it's how how large an integer do I need to count all my vertices? Oh, can you, so can you go back? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So the computer thinks that it's called the same way in the tensor parameter, right? Uh, you're saying it's... it's here. Yep. But you're saying this is back, back descriptor type or something? Yeah. Okay. So, I mean, that's um, So the comment was that it's confusing that... The, this is the same pr- template parameter name? So it, it, it is the same meaning and the same type as, and like if you see, it gets, it gets passed in here, uh, sorry, well, it gets passed in here to the, the, the base class and here to the, the node. Uh, so then, yeah, that's, that's that vertex coming through. Ah, so the question is, how do you actually associate a value type with a vertex? I'm not talking about it. <laughs> sorry, sorry if that wasn't clear. Yeah, I'm not going to talk about associating uh, yeah, values. Just pure structure. Uh, sorry? Does the node have an associated value um, type? No. Okay. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, so Bruce Graph, um, you know, s- started, yeah, using concept checking uh, this a long time ago, um, and it has concept checking classes for all of its bidirectional incidents, mutable, uh, etc. Uh, it's really just checking the the interface that. The, the functions exist and the types agree um, when you call them. Uh, so I created this one for forward binary tree. Uh, as you'll see, there's no mm, functions for mutating the tree. Um, bidirectional binary tree um, satisfies all the concepts of a forward binary tree, but you can also talk about a predecessor. Um, I assume it's also going to be useful to talk about the, the root uh, of a tree, and that's one of the like really big functional differences um, for making it bidire- why a bidirectional binary tree is more useful. Sorry? Is you have a root? Well, you can find the root. Yeah, you can find the root. Sorry, I yeah. missed it. Yeah, that's right. Um, um, so yeah, mutable binary tree, 
mutable forward binary tree concept. Um, I left this in just, just to sort of point out that this is, this is kind of very honest code. Um, what I'm showing you is, is mostly screenshots of the, of the code that I'm compiling and running. Uh, modulo white space changes for what to fit on a slide. But what you're seeing, all the code you see here is currently in a pull request. You know, you can download it um, after the show. Uh, so yeah, I've got, you know, something missing here. Uh, and I don't have a, there's no mutable bidirectional concept because, you know, bidirectionality only sort of introduces the idea of a predecessor and that is, that can be simplified to, well, I just want to re remove or separate my parent's successor. All right, so now I'm just gonna, gonna talk about how, how to implement the, the existing boost graph interfaces. So how to make a binary tree model uh, a general graph. So as I said, incidence graph is just modeling uh, outgoing edges. So that's this out edge iterator. There's a lot of boilerplate here. If you've used um, Boost Iterator Adapter before, you'll sort of recognize this. Uh, it uses CRTP, you know, curiously recurring template parameter. You pass it in. It's effectively a, it's, or the, the underlying iterator is a, a pointer to a constant vertex descriptor. It's gonna produce edge descriptors. Uh, it's forward traversal. And I've forgotten what the last one is. Does anyone remember? The last one, this, I think maybe this is the value type that it presents or the reference type, not so important. It is, I'm gonna jump forward a moment just to check, yeah. So you're really just passing in, uh, it's kind of a, a lot of code to really not do much, um, you know, a, the binary tree node just has a, an array of size two. But to satisfy the interface, you need to be able to iterate over it and produce an edge for each of those. So first and last is just first and last of that successes um, array that's on the node. Source is the, the vertex that you're um, when you're iterating over the edges for. Uh, in, it increments, and so it's there's a bit of logic in the iterator in the increment um, function because you just want to skip over successes that aren't there. Um, dereference is dereference and produces an edge descriptor from the, the source that you stored. So this is this post increment function. Um, increment is part of the boost iterator adapter interface. Post increment is just one that I've just added in for. Uh, modularity. So as long as you're not off the end and you're that edge or that <laughs> vertex descriptor is null, just go to the next one. So it's really just, it's just iterating through until it finds the actual um, edges that exist. Yep, so that's increment. So some of this code is sort of, it's, it's relatively Simple logic is just sort of a lot of boilerplate and sort of code around it. Um, yeah, the source of an edge is just the, the first because it's, it's edge descriptor is essentially just a pair. So it's first and second. Question. Yeah, Marshall. I'm looking at increment and post increment. Yeah. And, uh, never mind. I, I, I read something wrong. Sorry, never mind. All right, Marshall says never mind. Uh, the, the final part of it, the satisfying the incidence graph concept, um, we just need to produce those out edge iterators, uh, essentially now a, a begin and end of out edge iterators. So yeah, we just grab the successes, begin and end for the out edge begin, and the, the out edge end iterator is just end and end of successes to model the, the last one. 
what's the out degree of a, a, a binary node. Even though it's, you know, like we said, it's a cardinal tree, it always it has to a fixed number of successes, but you know, they may or may not be there. So we are still counting whether or not you have those successes. So it's just two minus the number of nulls in that array. All right. Any questions on incidence graph? In the terms of linear statistics, the possibility of the container to generate the iterators is also through the linear end. Here it looks like you put a responsibility in the construction to just the iterators. So the question is, is it possible to move that responsibility of transforming the, the iterator into the container of, of vertices? You have the container. You yeah. And then you extract things from the container. Mm. Which you could, but hmm. I, guess, I think your question maybe trying to is like, is there another way to do it? Yes, I'm sure there probably is. Um, why is it this this way as opposed to another? Uh, I guess just naturally I didn't have time to try every possibility. Um, I, but I think I probably still want to be able to simply iterate over some of these things and only iterate with transformation or adaptation in some circumstances. So I wanted that flexibility. All right. So we just did out edge iteration. Now we want to do in edge iteration. Uh, in edge iteration is, seems maybe a bit uh, unintuitive because there, there is only one, e one incoming edge for a bidirectional node. But to satisfy the interface, you still have to, have to um, present it as an iterator range. So this is kind of the, with the out edge iterator, we had that iterator adapter. It's a bit simpler here. We just use a transform iterator. Again, we just store the, the here we store the target and we're going to iterate through all of our sources or, or one of our sources, potentially one. And it's just sort of a cute solution you know, do I have a predecessor? Uh, so P is just going to be a bool. I'm curious to know how, how many other people sort of use this kind of trick, but my, my begin iterator is a pointer to the, the predecessor value, which is just a scalar. It's not a range or a container or anything. And my end iterator, if I have a predecessor, I'm just going to point to the memory address that's after that scalar value. If I don't have a a predecessor, it's just the same pointed to that value, i.e. an empty range. I'm curious, does anyone else sort of use this kind of trick? Sorry, say again? Yes, yeah, so I'm not, I'm not sort of referring, so you're saying the standard vector also does this, but I'm not referring to just the um, half open range sort of concept, but it's the idea that you can actually just define an, an iterator range over just an int by just pointing to it and pointing to the memory address after it and saying that here are two pointers, that's an iterator range. Um, you can also do this. Um, I don't know if you've ever sort of written an algorithm where you want to sort of model, for whatever reason, some standard um, uh, iterator sort of interfaces, and so you have a, an output iterator, um, but you know it only ever produces one value. You can just point that at a scalar, at, a, like, at a, something that's not a range, and it'll just store the value there, and you just better know that it's never going to store anymore. Um, sorry, Joe, you had a question? Uh, my question is, is that defined behavior because it's a scalar and you can take the address of one pass an array, mm. but can you take the address of one pass a scalar allocation? I believe it probably works. I'll, 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 repeat, I'll, re I'll repeat your question. You're asking, is like what I just described here of taking the, the address of one pass a scalar, is that defined behavior? Where if it was an array of length one, yeah. I believe that would be perfectly Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
Yeah, if it's an array length one, it'd be fine, but if this, this is just a scalar, is it, is it standard? I'm looking to the audience. I believe it is. I believe you could treat you know, just a, a, single yeah. a single variable as an array of length one. Yeah, I think we got to add it to the core language. That's core people that are better than us. I think you're right. The impression I'm getting is, is that yes, it's defined. Yeah. Um, for your previous question about storing integers, uh, so last year Bob Spiegel had this fancy pointer stuff, and one of the fancy pointers that he presented was a, a container which is indexed. You only store the index into the container, and then he separated the uh, the, what you might call as the base location from the index, because th this is this, he is trying to separate the concept concepts of indexing and access, All right. and that works naturally. Uh, okay, I'll try. So, so Bob Stegall presented a kind of fancy pointer so or a, fancy pointer a container. Or he took out he took pointers and then uh, tried to deconstruct the various things that they do and isolated them as separate concepts. And one of the things that fell out of that framework is that indexing is separate from access. So you can have, uh, you represent everything as indices. For example, the offset pointer is boosting the process to another one of those. Okay. It's maybe getting a little, little complicated for me to, to re repeat and re reply to, but it sounds like Bob Stegall has some interesting separation of, of concerns or functionality in terms of access and indexing um, in pointers and containers. Um, yeah, that sounds interesting. I should check it out. All right, I'm actually consuming some time, so I'll keep going. Uh, and just the, the, the wrap up of, of the bidirectional graph concept. Um, the, the degree of a bidirectional node is just whether or not you have a predecessor, because this is going to be zero or one. The, the total degree is the in degree plus the, the out degree. Whew. So this is just going back to this question, got a sparse array, how are you going to iterate over it? And this is why I think, yeah, now reflecting on how I've implemented it with the free list, this would be easier to just have um, using optional with this, you know, so I can just check, you know, is this vertex still there and just iterate or, you know, straight over it. And um, but that's not what, what it has. So what the conclusion I came to is I'm just going to have to iterate over the tree in a sort of traditional binary tree traversal algorithm, you know, depth first search or breadth first search, pre-order, in order, post order, one of those. I had to choose one. Uh, I chose in order just because I had to choose one. Uh, it turned out to be a bad decision because of like some sort of unspecified behavior of, of boost graph, um, which I'll, I'll come to. Oh, which I'll, I'll sort of explain here. Um, so the vertex iterator is, is literally just so you want to iterate over all the vertices in your graph, or in this case, binary tree. Uh, again, so using boosts, boost iterators, iterator facade. So we've got a lot of um, boilerplate code. Uh, I won't sort of explain it all, but if, if you want a question about any of it, um, go ahead. But in order to do this traversal on a, a forward binary tree, uh, I need to actually store a stack for the traversal, which is not really what you want to do in an iterator. You don't, I guess, really want to be, um, yeah, storing any you know, much or having potentially like linear um, operations on a. But it just seemed like there was no other way to avoid it, and later on we'll see. Um, even the simplest uh, yeah, traversal of a, a forward binary tree does use logarithmic stack space. Um, so I think it's unavoidable, at least with the sort of free list implementation that I used. Ah, so we store the, the traversal stack. Um, this is, I think, maybe the first time in my life I ever used a stack. Yeah. Uh, and last, I uh, just needed to, to know when the traversal is coming back up the tree, what was the last um, node that you came back up from 
You need to know whether you're coming from the left successor or the right successor. It changes the behavior. Well, I, mean, I won't explain all of this because I think in the future it's just going to be gone. Um, but it's, it's an in-order traversal of the, the binary tree stored in, in the iterator. So the iterator is maintaining that state of where is it up to. And the, the problem this actually um, caused is that an, an in-order traversal, you know, you, you, you sort of point it at the root node and say, I want to do an in-order traversal of, of this tree starting from the root node. But the root node is not the first node you visit. You start traversal there, but you, you, you traverse all the way down the left-hand side, and you visit the first node um, that's all the way down the left. This caused a problem with a, a hidden um, interface in Boost Graph in, in the detail namespace. There's a function um, get first default vertex or something like that. And get, def you know, first get default vertex calls, uses this iterator, kind of gets the, the begin vertex iterator and dereferences it, assuming that the begin is just going to be, you know, give that first value. But as you see in the constructor here, you say start here. It's like, sure, I'm going to start there. But now I'm going to traverse all the way down to some other vertex. And that's the one first one I'll visit. So you don't get the root node out when you just do begin. If I chosen pre-order traversal, that would have sort of fitted better here because the start node would also be the first vertex visited. Um, so that's, look, that's what this is. You, you dereference it, you get the top of the traversal stack. Um, when you increment it, you know that there's an in order traversal and the constructor has traversed you down to the first node you want to visit. You're already at the, the limit of left-hand nodes. So you check if you have a right successor and you, now you go right until you And as long as you can go right, then you go left again. So, and then once you've gone all the way to the left now, you found the next node you're going to visit. You stop it, you stop. You've done one increment of this iterator. If there was no right successor, then it's time to go back up. So you, you, that last node you actually visited, you need to remember it, you know, on the top of the traversal stack, and you start popping your stack, um, and you keep popping until you get back to it the next node that you visit for an in-order traversal. <coughs> Complicated, probably going to go away. Um, I have a yeah? Does this implementation uh, or this design not assume that the P is going to be somehow balanced? The question was, does this assume that the tree is going to be balanced? No. Because if, if you assume that, Yeah, yeah. If, if you have, if you can make assumptions or you, you have invariance on the on the structure of your binary tree, yes, then you can use different algorithms and different structures. But um, I guess the whole point of this is, is to have a, a totally general structure binary yeah. tree. But then, if your tree is not balanced, then you can have these iterators that can grow and grow and grow because it's, it's pushing on the stack. Um, so, in some sense, I think implicitly here, assume it's balanced or that it's not very deep. Right? Mm -hmm. Right. So, if it's a the question about balance is that if it is sort of an, so the question was about if the tree is unbalanced, you could have that sort of worst case scenario that your tree is, is sort of not de degenerate, but it's just it's all left hand successes, and so the, the depth is equal to the weight, and so your traversal stack will uh, be linear in the size of the tree. Um, yes, that that would happen, but there is no sort of concept of balanced in a general binary tree. You know, if, if what you've ended up with is a, a tree that's all left-hand vertices, that's what you got. Mm -hmm. that, that's modeling the thing that you're trying to model. Something has to give. I think what happens is basically your iterator doesn't model the iterator anymore because it stops being model one in many senses. No, I agree. You, so you're right saying that... Time or compile time or assume assumption time is not a iterator anymore. 
Yeah, yeah. So the, the comment is that you know, if your iterator can't handle or is going to run out of space or cause you know, performance problems, then it's not really modeling an iterator anymore. I agree. Well, it's, it's not ideal, um, but if it's the, like, at the time, this seemed like the, the way to achieve it. So it, it, it satisfies the interface. And so, yeah, a lot of this is a proof of concept. This is, this is not a data structure that's like ready to go into production. It's like, I, I can prove the concept, prove the concept that this you know, binary tree can model these graph interfaces. Okay. All right, getting actually short on time. So I'm gonna, let's leave questions till the end now. This is like a really quick clarification. Yeah. Thread the nodes and so the comment is you can thread the nodes, like store more data about. So the next point of reaching Yes. The iteration that way. Yeah, node threading um, to facilitate uh, traversal, uh, is, which is in Knuth. Is that the sort of threading you're talking about? Presumably. Presumably, yeah. There are other ways to, to solve the problem. Yeah. All right. Uh, Is that what I just talked about? Okay, I got a typo up here. This is three of three. Um, I don't know if I actually ever use this equality on iterators. No, I must, yeah. Um, it, fortunately, it doesn't need to check the entire stack, um, traversal stack, it just needs to check whether the top one is equal to the top one of, of the other iterator because there's, there's only one way to do an in order, you know, to do a traversal of a binary tree you only visit each node once. So if you're both at the same node, you both traverse the same way to get there. Um, assuming you're both in the same graph structure. Ah, then we need to, and here's this, um, so this is not exactly the, the um, function from Boost Graph. This is just like my equivalent to solve the problem. But here yeah, Boost Graph has this, this hidden um, detail function to make things work. So the point of that is that a binary tree can satisfy all these you know, boost graph interfaces. Uh, maybe not efficiently yet, but, uh, and I, you might have noticed I actually did not demonstrate edge list. I didn't get around to it. All right, now let's talk about some algorithms and benchmarks of them. So I'm not, and that'll, this will be the, the last, yeah, this is the last sort of part of the talk. Create tree and binary trees are very, very simple, but they, it's, it's just worth showing the code and showing the, the benchmark. Um, depth first search uh, is the, and isomorphism, the code is just directly from elements of programming. Um, yeah, so the exception, so create tree just uses general graph interface for adding vertices and edges, um, but create binary tree is gonna specifically use uh, the binary tree concept. And as I mentioned earlier, boost graph, when you add an edge, it checks so it's to check whether you really can add this edge and that it's valid and return you know, uh, false if you can't actually add it. Uh, the binary tree add edge does not check anything for you. It assumes that you you know that this edge is valid and just adds it. Ah, I use Google Benchmark. Does anyone not use Google Benchmark for benchmarking? Maybe a couple, yeah, a few. Um, I don't know, I love it. Uh, Google Benchmark says that this is my, my CPU. It's not quite true. I wish I had a, a base 3.7 giga, gigahertz uh, CPU. It's actually, um, you know, base 2.7 with 3.7 gigahertz, you know, Intel Turbo Boost. Um, take note of the fact that your one data cache is 32K. Um, the benchmark results are noisy. Uh, I noticed like five to 10% variation in results, which I don't know, to me, sounds pretty big. Uh, Were you making sure that you had the right like, power governor stuff? Power governors, yeah. Um, it's, it's on the performance governor. Um, so yeah, you know how Google Benchmark will tell you if you've got 
frequency scaling on on it's not on um, but I think the turbo boost which is still you know changing the frequency is a, a factor of noise I closed applications I'm still running it under the X you know Windows system I didn't quit out to just like a, a console to do these tests so, to pin any thread no no, so it's probably more, I'm not a, a professional benchmarker. I'm a, you know, it's a, I'm gonna get going. Um, we're almost done. So there is sort of five to 10% variation in the results, but I think the, the difference between the, um, the different algorithms and data structures is large enough that the noise is not um, going to remove confidence that there is a difference. Um, Craig Tree. Very simple uh, the tree you want to um, actually create and the weight is just a loop, it adds edges. So really the only sort of important part of this is that add edges from the, the boost graph interface. It uses the mutable graph concept. Uh, create binary tree is using add left edge and add right edge. Okay, it's using the, the mutable forward binary tree concept. Uh, in the next, in the actual benchmark graph, this algorithm is, is the one with the star. I thought, yeah, I just want to see like, is it, is it even just quicker to create a binary tree versus creating a binary tree in a, another data structure? All right, because by, by default, when, you, when I create a graph, um, the scale is linear. So this is an example of a bad graph. Although it's, I find like, for humans, it's sort of it's more intuitive to be like, yeah, that's that's a really big difference between adjacency list and bidirectional binary tree, the yellow and the cyan. But you, you lose all the information about what's happening, you know, down here at lower values of n, and there are interesting things to, to know there. So we're using logarithmic scales, and maybe just the key thing to sort of remember with the logarithmic this logarithmic, uh, logarithmic scale, a small difference on this scale is a big difference in result. So I was pretty happy. Um, we can see that adjacency list is the slowest um, graph to construct by, it's look, by my looking here, it's sort of like a factor of eight or nine. Uh, the next slowest algorithms for creating a tree is using the, the, the boost graph, the mutable graph concept, on the bidirectional tree data structure. Structure, no data. Um, these ones, the fastest ones is, the, is using the binary tree, um, forward binary tree interface. So that's great. Um, a better data structure is faster, but also a better, you know, using the concepts that apply to that data structure are faster. And much, much faster. What's going on here? Any guesses? Any thoughts? Cash stuff. Cash stuff. Yeah, that's what I thought. Anything more specific? Is it a thousand point four? Uh, so uh, I sort of I put an I put an extra measurement in there just to sort of get a bit more detail about where the the the, the changeover is. Um, you remember earlier I said that the L one cache size is thirty two k. This orange line is the bidirectional binary tree. A bidirectional node has three vertex descriptors. Each of them are eight bytes in size. So that's 24 bytes. Um, 32,000 divided by 24, roughly a thousand and something. This is roughly a thousand and something. So yeah, it's an L1 cache effect. Why is it not happening to everything else though? Why isn't there not an L1 cache effect on all the other? That was, that was Something I thought. And I think the reason is that when you when you modify um, a node in a bidirectional um, binary tree, you have to not, you have to modify the the parent and the child. And so once you've got more than that many nodes, that parent and child could now be what does John Lakos call it? Um, dispersed. Dispersed. Yeah, yeah. So you've lost the locality. Um, so that's why it doesn't, I think that's why it does not happen on the forward binary tree. Why it's not happening on the standard 
or the traditional boost graph algorithms? I'm not, I'm not sure. Um, depth first search. So it's, again, this code is, is sort of directly from elements of programming, uh, just except for the, the interface. This is the this is the step function that gets called iteratively in the, the next um, slide on the algorithm. Basically it's saying you've done your last uh, uh, given given a particular vertex, if you have a left, left successor, take it. If you have you know, but before that, do your pre-order visit, traverse the left successor. Once you come, once you come back up, you're gonna do the in-order visit. Now, if you have right successes, traverse them, and after that, you do the, the post-order visit. So this gets called iteratively. Oops, did I hit the right button? No, sorry, this is just this is the algorithm for forward binary trees. This is it. Audience question, what's the complexity of this? Thinking, space and time, complexity, worst case. Your time complexity is related to the weight of the tree. Yep, related to the weight of the tree. Your space complexity is all on the stack. It would be the height of the tree. Yep, space complexity is the height of the tree. Yeah, so linear, linear in the number of vertices, logarithmic um, in the the depth, or is, 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 is the depth? The tree. Linear in the height of the tree. Yes, thank you. Um, if the tree's balanced, then it's yeah, logarithmic in the weight. But. Right, yes, you can kind of get that sort of balance question. Um, and this sort of goes back to why that in order traversal actually had to maintain a stack on a forward binary tree. There's just sort of no getting away from if you're traversing a, a forward binary tree, there's going to be logarithmic space to remember how to get back up. Okay, bidirectional binary tree. This is the step function that will be called iteratively in the next algorithm. It's a little more complicated. We're just getting close to time. Um, this is a case where you tell it what your last visit was, your, your order, based on whether you just did a pre-order visit or a, an in-order or a post-order visit. It then knows whether you need to then go down a left successor or a right successor. Or if you just did a post-order visit, you need to pop back up. The other return value is the, the change in height, or in, sorry, in depth that this traversal uh, is up to. Uh, white space as exactly from uh, elements of programming. So this is then the, the algorithm that's, that's calling this in a loop. Uh, so the visitor is, is, is a callback, right? And so you, you, you're doing a pre-order visit, you actually call the callback, traverse, visit again, uh, and that keeps going until you get back up to the root, uh, or V is not, a, not equal to a post-order visit. I'm a little bit unsure about this algorithm, but I don't know, when I was sort of going over it with the slides, I was like, oh, does that work? Uh, it, it sure seems to. All right, let's look at the benchmark. It's a little closer this time, um, but still. So now we've got the compressed sparse row graph. So that's oh, that's just, just created by creating an adjacency list and then just putting all the result into the, the CSRG. Adjacency list is slower, slowest again. Compressed sparse row graph is faster, but happily not as fast as the binary tree. Um, so keep so keep in mind the boost graph classes are using the depth first search in boost graph. Thanks. Um, the binary trees are using the code that we just saw. So it's both a different data structure and a, a different algorithm or different impl implementation of that algorithm. So that's good. Uh, that's competitive. Definitely sort of competitive with com compressed sparse row graph and much faster than adjacency list. Isomorphism. Looks messy. It's actually like Again, it's just it's, it's for the forward uh, binary tree, so it's all recursion. It's essentially saying if I can traverse one tree in the same way that I can traverse another tree, you two trees are isomorphic. 
anytime I can't, it uh, returns false. Um, so it just traverses the entire tree recursively. And if it gets to the end, it's true, you're isomorphic. Um, bidirectional case, it's an iterative algorithm. It's reusing traverse step that we saw earlier for, breadth, um, for depth first search. So it's a, you know, a bidirectional tree, it's, it's storing more data. So presumably you can use a, a smarter algorithm because you have more information to work with. And saying, you know, as long as the, the, the visits, the pre, in and post order visits all happen in the same sequence, then the tree is the same structure. Interestingly though, well, boom. Um, this, this sort of be, this, this was kind of predictable. The isomorph isomorphism algorithm in Boost Graph is worst case factorial complexity. I actually hardly ever come across or use factorial complexity algorithms, but this is one of them. Um, adjacency list and compressed sparse row graph, essentially the same. Um, the forward binary tree is faster to calculate isomorphism. I don't know exactly why. Uh, that's essentially the end of the, 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 the content. Um, so the, the message here is like, if, if, if you're using a binary, you're rolling your own binary tree or you're, you're modeling a binary tree with the existing data structures in Boost Graph, please help me finish this project. Um, I, th I think you'll, you'll, you'll reap the rewards. Um, and that, that, so the sort of common thinking that like, oh, you know, the existing structures are fast enough, just, just use them, uh, is just, just not true. Ah, oh, there's some, some references, you know, all the smart algorithms and intelligent things came from these books, everything else was from me. Um, Thank you to uh, my employer, ResMed, uh, for funding uh, this trip and, and giving this presentation. But I also have to thank, I have to thank my wife because although uh, my employer funded me to come here, I did all this, this work and research in my own, my own time or our time. Uh, so I really thank her. What's next? Uh, it's not finished. It needs to be completed. I'm probably not going to have time to complete it uh, anyone who needs to use a binary tree should hopefully get involved. Uh, I'm, I guess I'm personally also really interested in compact data structures, um, you know, stored in the information theoretic limit of, of, of storage. And there's probably some great performance benefits to get there as well. I mean, just huge locality. Ah, that's where this, this uh, pull request is. Ah, the end. Thanks. We've got 57 seconds for questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> how many nodes were you in your lab when you did this? I mean, how many, uh, what was the size of N? Ah, how many, what was the size of N for uh, which, which particular benchmark? Well, well, for any of the benchmarks, I mean, how many, what was the order of the uh, number of vertices? Ah, so sorry, the, the letter N has fallen off the, the bottom of this graph. But sorry, this, this is N. Ah, I left, I left off the labels on this graph, I'm sorry. Um, Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Was there a particular one you wanted to look at? No, I just wanted to, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Um, sorry, just no, no, uh, no, no I'll, I'll, I'll give you first. Um, in your isomorphism check, uh, let's say. Uh, so the, co the code or the benchmark? Yeah, the benchmark. Hmm. The algorithm that you have is way simpler than what would be needed for a, for a general graph. Yes. Right? Yes. So, I would say so. Uh, presumably, yes. Yes, the algorithm for a binary tree is much simpler um, than yeah than the algorithm for a, so a general graph. Would you expect ah, I think I can predict what your question is. Did I try using the general, the factorial iso isomorphism algorithm on the binary tree data structure? Uh, or vice I, versa. I, I meant to. Yeah. Didn't get around to it. Yeah. That would be. Yeah, that would tell you something. Yeah. Sorry, did you have a, another question? Uh, no. Hmm. Anyone else? Yeah. So it wasn't clear to me. At the end, do you keep the interface of having this bull cast left, blah blah, bull cast right? 
Mm. This one? Yes. Mm. So you kept the, the, the design from elements of programming. Could it be better to have some kind of, you know, like we have in the field dot n, or in this case would be dot leaf or something that will mark that you reach one that doesn't have the support at the end to the left or the right? So your question, the question is, um, would it be better to, to rep represent yes. the data represent differently? Represent having the left or the right in the Glacier itself, or comparing to something. So how to represent whether or not you have a left or right successor yeah. differently? Well, or you go there and it's null or something, right? Because yeah. It seems that you have a concept of null anyway. Yeah, yeah there, I mean, there is a concept of a, an empty node, an empty vertex, which is what has left or has right successor is just testing. Mm. So the end, because it affects the interface later when you have the search, for example, in the previous slide, no? The search, model. what are you returning there? Um, uh, so admittedly, what I've shown here is just the, the guts of the depth first search and not the... Right, because you return the integer. Uh, okay. this, is, this is the step function inside here. So yeah, this is just the, the, the guts of the depth first search algorithm, which will be wrapped by a, the depth first search function that, that matches the boost graph um, you know, kind of interface. So let's say you have a fine algorithm, a search algorithm, what will you return if you don't find it? Or if you don't find much? A find or a search? Yeah. It, then, and now you're talking about a, a tree that has data? That's you're, you're true, yes, I can mean data for that. Mm, mm. That's true, yeah. So okay. once you have data, then the problem is larger and you need to think about all yeah. the information. Yeah, once you add data, yeah. then yes, you've got a whole new world of algorithms to yeah. utilize. One thing that has right or left is very accurate because then you have to return an optional uh, instead of an interface. Okay. I'm not, I'm not quite sure maybe what you're, yeah. But it, yeah, maybe we'll move on to a, any other questions? Well, that's good, thanks.